Hey, this is Chris Plush from CG Masters. In this tutorial, I'm going to show you how to prep your models for printing using a site called i.materialize. The example I'll be using here is a pair of earrings I made for my girlfriend based on the axe from the show Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I'll give you a quick breakdown of the creation process where I'll emphasize the more difficult aspects of modeling and give you some tips on preparing your models for print. Here's the finished 3D model. Right off the bat, I want to point out that the model dimensions will be your print dimensions. You'll be uploading your model in either millimeters or inches. So the first thing you need to do is specify the dimensions in Blender. So go to the Scene tab, and in the Units panel you can change the dimensions. I modeled this in millimeters, so I chose metric at a scale of 0.001, which is 1 1,000th of a meter, otherwise known as a millimeter. If you want to model in inches, you'd use the imperial measurement. I'm not actually going to go over any modeling of the axe. As far as axes go, this one's pretty simple. If you look at it closely, it's mostly just circles and squares extruded. The most difficult part of modeling this axe was probably joining all the objects together into one seamless mesh, and that's what we're going to get into right now. Now for this model to print right, it has to be one solid object. So we're going to have to join together any separate objects we have together into one seamless mesh. Right now, it's actually three separate objects, so I'm going to show you a couple techniques for joining them together. Let's start with the top two objects. With both of them selected, we could use a boolean modifier to add these together automatically. But this is going to be such a simple connection that I'd rather do it manually. So I'm going to select the square rod, hold shift, and select the axe edge, or the axe I mean, and press Control and J to join them together into one mesh. Now we join them together in one mesh, but that doesn't mean they're one seamless object, because this rod is still intersecting the axe above it we actually have to join those vertices together. So I'm going to go into edit mode and I'm going to hold alt and right click on the inner circle of the axe top and press X to delete those vertices. Now I'm going to hold alt and select one of the edges at the top of the rod to select all of the edges at the top and then press G and then Z to move that down so it's flush with the bottom of the object above it. Now we simply have to face all this area to connect the square rod to the axe. But first I'm going to press E to extrude and then S to scale that up a little. I do have subsurf modifiers on this object so we're going to have to add extra detail around the edges to make sure things aren't smoothed out too much. So I extruded that and scaled it up a bit. Now I'm going to press Ctrl and R and add a loop cut there and slide that up so we have three loops of edges at the top of the square rod there. Now hold Alt and right click on one of the edges of the inner circle. Hold Alt and Shift and right click on one of the edges at the top of the square rod and press Alt and F to automatically face that, that whole empty area. Now we're going to join the bottom two objects together using the boolean modifier. The first thing we're going to do is go into edit mode of the top object and we're going to add a loop cut right here, very close to the ring on the bottom. The reason I'm going to do that is because the boolean modifier can sometimes have a messy result. So if we add edges close to where the ring is, close to where the addition calculations will be, then uh, the less messy it's going to be in the end. And you'll see what I mean. So. First, I'm going to select the bottom ring of vertices there, press S and then Z, and hold Control and snap that down to zero so it's perfectly flat. Now press Control and R, and then left click and add a new loop cut right about there. And do the same thing, press S and then Z, hold Control and snap it down to zero. So now we have this line of edges, or this loop of edges here, very close to the ring. And that's going to give us a bit of a cleaner result after we use the boolean modifier. So now we're ready to use the modifier. So select the ring down here and in the properties window go to the wrench icon which is the modifiers buttons and let's add a new modifier. Select boolean under generate and click this arrow here, the up arrow, to move it above the subsurf modifier because we want to apply this modifier before we apply the subsurf modifier. And under object here, select the other object we have in the scene, which is the top object named plane.001. 
and it'll take a second to perform the calculations. And the reason we only have a little bit there is because I forgot to change the operation from intersect to union. So once you change that option and give it a second to calculate, you should have one solid object. I'm going to press the I icon here, the I button on the subsurf modifier to turn that off just so we can speed up the 3D view. All right, let's go into wireframe view and see how it looks. We'll zoom in and you'll see how it joined together. But you'll see in the background our original object here is still hanging around. So I'm going to press, I'm going to select that and press M and move that to a hidden layer. I'm not going to delete it just in case we need it as backup. So now in shaded view we can see how that connection went. And it looks all right. I mean it's a lot faster than doing it manually but it's not always going to be very clean. So let's select this object and let's turn back on the subsurf modifier just to see how it looks in the final version. That doesn't look bad at all. Now if you're happy with the result just click on the apply button on the modifier to apply the boolean modifier. Now although you can see a lot of artifacts around the joint here from the boolean process they're not going to be visible once your object is printed. Keep in mind that this is a very tiny earring. So when you zoom out you barely see it in 3D view here. So when these objects are actually printed that's going to be smoothed out by the printing process and then also the polishing process after it's printed. Now before we export the model, we're going to finalize the model. And by that I mean we're going to center it in the world, we're going to check for non-manifold edges, and then we're going to apply any modifiers that we're using. So my object's already centered in the world, and I'm not even sure if that's necessary for print, but I do it just in case. And now we're going to check for non-manifold edges, and what that means is we're going to check for any holes in the model, because if there's any holes in the model, if it's not one solid mesh, it's going to fail when it goes to print. So let's go into edit mode, and make sure no vertices are selected. Go into the select menu in the 3D view, and select non-manifold. That will select any edges that are around a hole in the mesh, and it appears that no vertices are selected, so it doesn't look like we have any holes in the mesh. So that kind of sucks for me trying to illustrate exactly what non-manifold is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select a few vertices here, press X, and I'm going to delete them. So I just created a hole in the mesh. And now if I go back to the select menu and select non-manifold, it selects all the edges around that hole, basically telling us, hey, you need to fix this hole before I can print. Now I'm going to press Control and Z and undo that since we had a perfect mesh to begin with. Alright, so the object centered, we checked for non-manifold, and now all that's left is to apply any modifiers we have. You don't have to apply the subsurf modifier because when we go to export it you will have the option to apply that modifier before exporting, but the reason I do it manually is just so I can see with my own eyes that it did in fact apply the modifier. Now let's go ahead and apply this. I actually turned the subsurf level down to 1 because I thought 2 was excessive. And although i.materialize doesn't have a polygon limit, they do have a file size limit of 100 megabytes, so keep that in mind. Now click on Apply, and it'll apply the modifier at the View Subsurf level. Now all that's left is to upload it. i.materialize supports a large number of file formats, the best of which I think are .stl and .obj. So now just go into the File menu and select the format you want from the Export menu. Once you've exported it, go to i.materialize.com and follow the instructions for uploading. Now the finishing touch, paint. After doing some research on the best type of paint to use for jewelry, I found this popular enamel paint by testers. A lot of people apparently use these paints for their car models and things like that, and it works great on jewelry too. Not to mention this set is very cheap. I've never painted jewelry before, but this glossy enamel paint worked perfectly along with some fine detail brushes to apply it. The difficult thing about enamel paint is it becomes tacky as it dries, which makes touching up mistakes difficult the longer you let it set. So you want a smooth finish, especially with a glossy paint, so work fast and paint with precision. This was a fairly easy object to paint since it's just flat colors. And any mistakes I made, like if I accidentally painted the silver bar here, after everything dried I simply just scratched it off. But I was very careful about scratching it off because this is silver and that scratches very easily. But the paint just scratched off pretty easily as well. 
And that does it for this little overview on 3D printing. Although I didn't need them for this particular model, my teammate 80 suggested I mention the add-on for 3D print tools in Blender for further researching. You can find more information on that on the wiki page here. This add-on can be enabled in the user preferences and contains quite a few cool and useful tools for 3D printing.